involves security. So uh, what I'm really interested in is using uh, automated tools to automatically find security vulnerabilities in the program. And that actually uses a lot of the techniques that we're going to talk about in this class as the basis for that. So part of a lot of compiler techniques and those kind of things that we use there, we actually use uh, in my research a lot. So that's why I'm really stoked to be teaching this class. And yeah, okay, a little bit about my background. I did, let's see, five, no, well, a total of nine years at UC Santa Barbara. Um, so I did like a five plus one, or a four plus one undergrad thing um, there in computer science, and then worked for Microsoft full time as a software developer. And I decided I really, really like doing research, so I went back to Santa Barbara for a PhD. And then I came here to ASU, so this is the start of my third year of ASU. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to be super excited when the weather cools down a little bit, so I'm not a little dripping while I'm up here talking to you. But I think with a room like this, we should be good on AC, right, since we're not 438 students in here. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. So if you have any questions about what it's like in industry, what industry people are looking for, feel free to send an email. We have talk about that or come to my office hours. Uh, always happy to chat with interesting, interesting and interested students. Questions? Cool. All right. So here's the course web page. So this is basically all the information you need will be on this website. We have a Blackboard page. If you go to my ASU, the Blackboard page is really just for homework submissions and to give you your grades. That's it. So all the information you'll need about projects, about when homework assignments, when things are due, these will all be on the website, so it's your responsibility to check it and keep up to date. All right, um, let's see. Nothing super crazy in here. Meeting times, you all found the right place. That's good. Uh, let's see, OK. All right, so everything's going to be on here. Now let's go over to the super fun syllabus. OK, so something we have to do is make sure that when we start the course, you're on the same page and I'm on the same page because I want you to be successful in this course. So who's heard about 340 before? If you want to share something that you've heard about the course? No? Yeah? And pack that up? No? OK. It's a big room. We're all friends here. Flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> the first thing to know, although it helps a little bit. I'm just kidding. I have no idea who you are. You're just some guy in the audience right now. <laughs> maybe over time. Okay, I like that. But anything else? I mean, about the course itself, maybe? Yeah. Start early in the assignment. Yes. Start why? They're long. They're long and difficult, right? They're These are going to be some of the most challenging projects you will do up to your computer science career at this point. And so my goal is to challenge you and push you and set really high standards because the people graduating this class are the people who are able and ready to solve complex problems using computer programs. And so that's what I want you to do. So but you have to help me, help me help you, right? You have to start early on projects. You have to actively try and do these things. I have met many students over the last year and a half who up to this point are very good students, very smart, very bright, like everyone in this room, and then they wait until two days before a four-week project is due to start. And they do not finish on time. And so they take a zero for that assignment. And this can happen to many, many people. So this is, yeah, starting early. Uh, anything else? Class is hard. It should be. And you should like it that it's hard because you're, you like solving challenges and this is going to make you better, more employable programmers in the future. Cool. Okay. We have two TAs who I believe are not here. Is that correct? And you want to pretend to be the TAs? No. Um, cool. So Eric and Mosin are TAs for this course. Uh, they're both PhD students in computer science. They have a lot of experience. I know some of you are at Eric's uh, recitation section yesterday, so you got to meet a little bit about him. He's a very interesting person. And uh, Mosin has TA'd this course, I think, since 2011. Like, he's probably 
don't tell him this, but he probably knows more about this course than I do. So he's a great resource who can help you be successful in this course because he's seen literally the gamut of what makes people successful in this course. So you can see on the website we have office hours, so please feel free, come visit us in our office hours if you're having trouble with the material, if you want to talk about projects, anything. That's what we're here to help you. Uh, because there's three of us and it can get communication can be a little bit weird. Uh, if you want to send an email to me or us, if you use this email address, csc340 spring s16 at asu.edu, that'll get routed to all three of us so that one of us can respond to you. So um, you know. Take a look around and look at all of your fellow students in this class. I'm sure there's people in the back. You guys are oddly not distributed evenly throughout here, right? It's like if I, if I kind of drew it, right? There's a lot of you, right? We want all of you to be successful, so you have to help us. If you do things like this, if you, as I see, ask questions on the mailing list, then we can help you, and your fellow students can help you. If you just send emails directly to me, they can get buried in a lot of other emails and other things that I have to deal with. Uh, this is a very good way to make sure your email gets progressed. Questions so far? Wait. Sorry, I promise we won't take it too long on this because I want to get some cool stuff there. Okay, yeah, so office hours, uh, we want you to, you know, one of the worst things is when a student comes to my office and is like, I don't understand this. And you're like, okay, that's totally fair. I had trouble understanding this material too. Great. What don't you understand? And what things have you tried? And you just say, well, I don't know, I just don't get it. Okay, well, what have you tried? Have you read the book? Did you read any other readings, right? So it's up to you to take responsibility for your education and try to train yourself the best you can in this material. Um, you know, we will help everyone, but it will be much more successful helping if you take the time and effort to read into these things. Uh, there's a fantastic essay that I highly encourage everyone in this room to read. How to ask questions the smart way. We all want to be smart, right? We all are smart and we work hard, right? So asking questions, right? Maybe it's something you haven't thought of, right? It's how to ask questions. This has fantastic examples of how to ask questions so that people can help you. And it's related to what I just talked about, right? So if have you ever had like a friend email you and was like, hey, could you help me with pointers or something or linked lists? And you're like, that question is so generic, but how could I ever respond to that in a fixed amount of time, right? What's more useful is, hey, I'm having this trouble with linked lists. It turns out my linked lists are empty, but I tried this code. I'm adding things to this linked list, and I searched for these keywords, but I can't find anything that helps me. So that demonstrates to us that you're actually actively looking for things and that you're not just saying, hey, I don't know how to do this. You help me, right? It's like, no, you've done the work, and you you, you're just stumped, and so, but you put work in, and so we'll definitely help you. Uh, so this is good for advice for the rest of your career as well, not just this class. Cool. All right, course communication. So Google group, so I use Google group. You'll be required to sign up for this Google group. Any announcements about project due dates, whatever, will be made through this Google group, so it's a good way for me to announce things to all of you is also a fantastic resource for the um, for you to get help from other students and to help other students. So that way, one of us can't reply right away. Super happy, and I really think that's the way we're going to be successful is if you help each other on these projects. Uh, we also, that made me re re uh, realize, we also have some TAs who are not yet listed on the website, but they will be. Uh, we have some undergrad TAs. Do they want to stand up? and wait so maybe you can see their faces. So they will have office hours in the computer labs. Yeah, you want to clap Yeah! Woo! Okay, okay, you can sit down. Uh, you make them stand the whole time. Um, so they've taken this course, they've done really well, which is why they're undergrad TAs for this course. And so they're very familiar with the material, they're familiar with the projects, and so they'll be holding office hours in the computer labs so you can come to them for help. They'll also be very active on this mailing list, answering your questions. And so I think we're actually, we have, I believe the count is six. Some of those four of you here, I think there's other people who couldn't come. So we have lots and lots of support for you in this class. Cool. Questions? 
can't ask questions. It's okay. Just upgrade your camera. Can I ask a question about the project? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so yes, but in a bit. Yes. So the mailing list is uh, spring 15? Yes. Okay. Uh, no.
right, so here's kind of the layout of the courses. I'm not going to go into this. You can peruse this at your leisure. Um, we will have five projects in this course, eight homework assignments, and three midterms. Uh, the homework assignments are a lot more in number than last semesters, but they will be this, pretty much the same amount of work, just spread throughout the semester more, so you get more feedback. That's the point of the homework. So the homeworks will be very similar to the midterm problems, so you're doing homeworks to practice, get these concepts together so that you can be successful in the midterm, because we want you to be successful. Uh, midterm dates are already up, so anybody asking about midterm dates, these are set in stone. There's a lot of days off, apparently, this semester. Yes, we still have to cover next year. Uh, final exam, a little bit. Uh, if you have any, if anything conflicts with the religious holidays or anything, please contact me. We'll definitely accommodate those. Anything else? Alright. Workload. Alright, it's going to be hard. That's what this says. So. <laughs> this is the main thing. It requires consistent effort. And this is actually one of those things that people underestimate how effective consistent effort is. Um, some of the best, the people who do the craziest, coolest research projects are not the brilliant, smart people that just see these things and then it suddenly strikes them and they have this epiphany. It's people who are smart and work hard. Right? They consistently make effort on these problems and that leads to really good results. So you'll get the same thing in this class. All right. Uh, Homework assignments, there'll be homework assignments, there'll be midterms, uh, no outside notes or material, five projects, one final. Here's the breakdown of how everything will be split weight wise 15% homework, 30% midterms, 40% projects, 50% final exam. Projects one and two will be 5% each, three, five will be 10% each. Three, four, and projects three, four, and five are the very difficult projects. That is why they're worth 10% of your grade. Right? I think it's only fair if you're going to put in the time and the effort to do these programming assignments that you get the credit for it. Questions, grade for 10th grade right now? Cool. Alright, so these are the initial thresholds of the grades. So this is my promise to you. This next line says that I'll, I can lower the thresholds, but I want to raise them. So that means if you get a 94%, that will always be an A. It could be an A plus if the highest grade in the class is 94, and I feel like A plus needs to move down. Uh, I haven't had to curve down really far, so don't count on it. Anyway, <coughs> nervous chuckling. <laughs> there. Okay, this goes back to the adults. Homework must be submitted by 11.59.59 p.m. No late homework. Does this mean homework five minutes late is accepted? No, I have given zeros to people for homework that's five minutes late. You'll get feedback, which is important, but for point-wise, it's going to be a zero. Right? So, this is your forewarning, right? It's for your warning. Projects, we're a little bit more lenient because we know how, or I know how difficult the projects are. So you'll get a 20% deduction. That means if you're five minutes late, it will be 20% off whatever you would have got when you submitted that homework assignment. So the max you could get submitting it up to a day late would be 80%. The max you could get for two days late is 60% and 40% and 20% down to zero. Okay. Oh, quiet. It's gonna be fun. Here's something I kind of already wrote, but um, recording class lectures, so I will try to record the audio and the screen of all the class lectures and post them online. However, and this is actually a very good point, uh, this is not guaranteed. And this is a good point because, A, if you're watching this online now, you'll notice that there is no video recording. That would be because I forgot my laptop at home, uh, or not at home, at my office on the way here. So I'm doing this all on this machine here, and I don't have my normal recording set up. So I'm trying to record all the stuff on the mic and post a, that uh, MP3 or whatever on YouTube. So there's be a big black.
my boss. So I'm going to try to do that. I've done it for two semesters. Every single class, so I just broke my street on the first day of this class. So I don't know how that goes for the rest of the class, but you know, I try. And there is the material, so you're free to reference the material from the past two semesters too. That's on uh, my website under teaching. You can see like all the recorded lectures from 340 spring, 340 fall 15. These are all the things. That's 50 videos on here. How long is it? So like all spring, if you choose to not attend and just watch the lectures, that's fine with me out there. Uh, but you will, I try to keep my lectures more discussion based, that's why I'm trying to get you to participate. And I think you learn a lot more when you're here present and you can ask questions. Uh, cell phones, I think we're actually doing pretty good on this. They may not keep their cell phone on vibrate constantly. That's fine. Yeah, don't be, I, I know. Yeah. There's probably like used to be a huge problem, and now it's like, it's like, I don't even know what my cell phone ringtone sounds like. <laughs> okay, any special accommodations with the Disability Resource Center, please contact me. I can take care of that. Okay, now we get to the super serious, very, very important part of the syllabus, and that is the plagiarism and cheating section. <sighs> okay, so you're all adults, you've read the ASU Student Code of Conduct, the ASU Student Academic Integrity Policy, and yet, in every course, I have so far issued 23 academic integrity policy violations. So when this happens, I meet with you, I show you the evidence, and then I report it to the dean's office. And I've reported this regardless of people who have, you know, I, I'll say it this way. I have every person that I've caught violating the academic integrity policy, I've reported to the dean's office. So, and the dean's office keeps a list. What happens there is the first time, uh, well, so okay, I guess we go here. So in my class, when you violate the academic integrity policy, you get a zero on the assignment, right? Which makes sense to get you cheated on that assignment, you should get a zero. And you get a lower letter grade in this course. So if you were able to get a B, that B would turn into a C. And this is because this is really unfair to the rest of the students in the class who are doing the work themselves and not violating that criteria policy. And when the violation gets reported to the dean's office, then if it's your first violation, you meet with the somebody in the dean's office. Uh, you get you can't be a TA. You get put on a list that uh, if it happens again, you get uh, suspended for a year, and there's all these horrible consequences. So. Don't let it be your first offense. Don't get any, I, I really don't want this number to increase at all, because I hate going through this, but I will because it's fair to everyone else in the class. Um, oh, hello, okay. Cool, so the tiny little caveat, you can use code snippets that you find online. Let's say you're Googling how do I check, uh, how do I reverse a list in Stack Overflow or something, or how do I reverse a list, you come to some Stack Overflow code, you can use that code as long as you put in the comments of your source code where you got it, right? So it should be a link in the comments that says, hey, I got this at this web page, right? So that is, A, I believe it's a little bit more realistic for you in your coding experience because you can in some ways do this uh, in your career. But also this way, if two of your code matches and you say, huh, this function to reverse a linked list is exactly the same between two students, how could that happen? You both said, well, we got it from this thing online, then we can say, okay, yes, that was covered here. But otherwise, if the code matches, we're going to have problems. Um, using another student's code, past or present. So that means anybody in this room, anybody who's taking this course, remember we have everything back to 2011, so it has been tried and it's been found. Yeah. If it's not, if it ends, if it's 90% of your program, yeah, we'll have problems. Um, I highly doubt you'll find something like that. So yeah, no, you will, you will not have problems. Because I encourage you to, you know, you're extending your learning by going out and finding those kinds of things. Yes? Code from GitHub. 
Is it another student? See this, the, like how would we know? It, it says CSP 340 on the top and it solves the exact problem we're trying to solve. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, Stack Overflow is a little bit easier to whitelist because their license says that every code posted is created common so people can use it, right? So it would depend on precisely what the, what the license is of that code, right? You have to be aware of software licenses uh, when you do these kind of things. I think on GitHub, everything should be open source, so it should be fine. Yeah, so if it's like, I took this function from this random unrelated code on GitHub, fine. Yeah. I don't love Professor Service Council. 
responsible for your own code, right? You're responsible for what happens to your code. So be aware. And this also means, well, okay, yeah, no posting on. Syllabus, material, good class. I know we ended kind of on a downer. I should add something fun after that. <laughs> Candy on Thursdays. So. We don't have class on Thursday. Okay. Project one is already released. I'm going to give you the briefest overview of it because this is the point of the recitation sections is to give you in-depth insight and go over these projects. So project one is due August 29th. There are really this project is structured to make help you be successful in the rest of this course. I made some tweaks to this project, and I think it's going to help you be successful in this course. So sign up for the mailing list. Boom, 10 points. Super easy. Easiest 10 points you'll ever get in this class. All right, part two, set up a CentOS 7 virtual machine. Right? Why CentOS 7? Um, OK, part of the answer is because we say so. But part of the answer is that we're using an automated grading system for all of your assignments, right? So we don't want to hear, and it's not a valid excuse that, oh, but the code works on my Windows machine. The server's not running Windows, right? This is just like when you're in your career and you're working in a company, you often don't get to choose the development environment, right? The development servers are running Ubuntu 14.04. Your code better work on 14.04. Otherwise, it doesn't work, right? So that's the same policy in this course. So Mosin created this awesome Sent OS guide of how to install it. Even created a virtual machine for you, so you don't have to do it. You just have to download this, start the VM, and you have everything you need to go there. So I have a question: If we use yes. a different Linux environment, we can just validate by checking that it works. It is. You are accepting responsibility totally on your own shoulders. I would check to make sure that the GCC version matches. That's one of the biggest issues. Uh, Red Hat, or CentOS 7 is a little bit newer, so I think we should have less of those problems. But still, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work on CentOS 7, it might not work. I know previously the version of GCC on the, on the homework server did not default to C11. Has that been updated to a version that does? Uh, short answer is I don't know. <laughs> Whatever one is on CentOS 7. I know it's an updated GCC version. I think it will do that by default, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, Mosin is handling the whole submission system, so absolutely send an email if there's any discrepancies. And then we'll share that out with everyone so that we can make sure we're on the same page. At the very least, it'll just be like flags to set or something. Cool. OK, if you don't have a system where you can install a virtual machine, the computers in the Brickyard uh, 214 lab, where the undergrad TAs will be having their office hours, have CentOS 7 VMs on them. So you can use those. Cool. OK. This is the course submission website, which is not up yet. Uh, it's the first day. And so OK, so Mosin is running the course submission thing. Do not bother him that the thing's not up yet. When it's out, it will be announced on the mailing list. OK. Then once you get all this, to show that you actually have set up your environment and are not just going, yeah, yeah. Who wants to go through the hassle of setting up all this junk? I'm just going to use my Windows machine, which people do, and then they get into problems. Right? It's all about helping you. Helping you. Uh, you download this code, you run it, uh, it'll be on the submission site, and you submit the output. Okay. You can go into the details. OK, part three. Ah, uh, let me get to the actual stuff. Oh, no, we're going to go to 50. Cool. So, one thing of writing reliable software is being able to write correct code, right? You want to write code that's correct, that does what it's supposed to do, and doesn't do anything more, right? So, in this class, we're going to be writing programs completely from scratch. We're going to give you a description, say, here's the input, here's the output, build it, right? Which is similar to what you're going to be doing at a job. And so part of that is you need to code correctly, but part of that is being able to actually test your own code. So part three, we will give you a C program, and you have to create test cases that exercise 100% of the code of that program. 
So the goal there is to get you used to some tools that measure code coverage and to think about and really understand code. And the other side benefit, so in a lot of your classes, your programming classes, you're writing new code, right? Creating things from scratch, right? writing new functions and stuff that you control. No? I don't see a lot of nodding heads. Yeah? You go into industry, you're going to be creating everything from scratch. No, what's most of your time spent doing? <laughs> Reading documents. Did somebody say that? Yeah, that's good. Reading documents. Reading other people's code, right? You have to integrate into a monster you know, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 line of code piece of software, and they're like, hey, change the text on this button. Right? That was literally my first bug that I had to do when I was working at Microsoft. And it took me two days. Because <laughs> you don't know, they're in resource file today. It's my first time at C-Jar. So that's part of this assignment, is learning how to read and understand other people's code. Right? So I wrote this code, and so it's going to be useful for you to read this C code, get really familiar with C if you're not, and uh, understand how to test it. Okay. Any high-level questions on this? I'm going to not go over this anymore. Okay, cool. Further project questions? Rest, oh, I was going to say, in recitation section. I'll take one more. Yeah. Do you C or C++ on the project, or just C? Uh, it depends on the project. Okay. So it'll be either C or C++. Uh, no, no, sorry. They'll be, we'll either say you need both or just. Uh, no, I think for everyone you can use either one. But we may tell you specifically once you use a C style struct linked list rather than using like linked list class or sets or hashes or something. But when we go into the really complex stuff, it'll be mostly up to you. Yeah? So if you miss some test cases, can you resubmit those items? Yes. You have unlimited submissions on the submission site for now. Let's see how you do it. Abuse or use that. Yes. Some people are laughing because we had a problem last year of too many submissions taking down the submission server. I think some people are spending a hundred times. And this is why having a local environment is really important, right? So you can actually test and not use the server as your oracle and just be like, ah, make one change, just throw it to the server, right? You imagine like working somebody like that, just constantly committing code and like pushing it to production to see it works. So my lecture slides, my lecture slides will be available. The, most of the lecture slides and recitation sections will avail, be available. Um, the recordings hopefully will be available. We'll see how I keep going with this. Cool. All right, let's get to it. Ten minutes of fun. I don't know about it. Good. Okay. Cool. All right. So this class is Principles of Programming Languages, right? So what is the programming language? You've been programming three or four years or something in your career, your junior, senior level, some of you masters, graduate students. So what is the programming language? You've been playing with it for a while. What is it? This is not a rhetorical question. I want to see hands before I call on people. Yeah. <laughs> it's tricky, right? We use it all the time. We shouldn't be able to say what it is. You want another crack or you want to let somebody else go? Uh, come back. Maybe. All right, cool. Let's go here. Uh, High level machine code. High level machine code. What does that mean? What is machine code? Well, machine code, I believe, should, it's just ones and zeros, right? Ones and zeros, okay. High level ones and zeros? <laughs> well, to the point where it's legible. Cool. So legible, yeah, let's go here. Intuitive for who? Us as humans. Us as humans? Ooh, keep that in mind when we look at some examples. Yeah, <laughs> quite true. Instructions to, instructions to solve a problem. Instructions, ooh, I like that. Instructions to solve a problem. Is that different from an algorithm, though? Right? An algorithm is kind of a series of steps to solve a problem, but is an algorithm a programming language? Why not? What's it missing? I'll go somewhere else. Let's go somewhere in the back over there. Anybody over there? Yeah. Uh, it's how we talk to computers. Ooh, how we talk to computers. Like Siri? <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a lot of problems. We have to solve it. Sorry. We got a problem, we want to solve it, and what? She can't talk to the internet right now. Trigger. 
Put her in airplane mode so my phone won't ring. Oh, yeah, I got it. It's a constructed language which can be compiled or translated into machine language. Okay. Having okay. syntax and um, semantics. It's a little too close to what we're going to talk about here. <laughs> cool. So I, I, there's a lot of ways, right? So I kind of like, I may actually change this because I think every time I teach this class, I think about different ways because your ideas about what a programming language are are very interesting, right? I kind of think of it like a structured way to define computation, right? So it's not just, so this separates it from me describing an algorithm to you in English, right? I could maybe describe bubble sort to you in English, and you would understand how to do it and could do it, but if I took that same English explanation and gave it to the computer, it would go, I don't know what you're doing. Um, so, right, so it has to be structured in some way so that the computer can understand it. And, okay, yeah, so this could be one thing. I like the idea that it's different than just a pure algorithm because it needs to somehow be able to be executed by a computer or the task has to be carried out by the computer. Uh, what are some other purposes of programming languages? Why do we use them? Do we just use them to talk to the computer, let's say? Let's use kind of the communication idea. Do we just communicate with the computer? Anybody over here? Or is this split into like quadrants or something? Okay. We communicate with other people that use programming languages, both share code, talk about it. Yeah, so you're, Actually, yeah, that's a good point, right? So you could actually not even, it may be a way to precisely describe an algorithm to share with somebody else to show them that you don't even want it to be executed, right? It's a communication medium. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah? I mean, it kind of depends on the paradigm that you're looking at or, or your um, the sort of problem you're trying, trying to solve. In some cases, it might be effective to take an object-oriented approach um, and, and where you have, like, we'll define objects with uh, behaviors and uh, that do different actions. Other times it might be you're doing more things with like databases, so your uh, language is more of just a series of uh, rules yeah. that you then um, pass data through. I can see. So there's different maybe ways of how to structure this computation, right? So there's different ways we can think about describing computation. Yeah. Right. So to communicate an algorithm, that can be definitely one way. Any, well, maybe to describe a process, we want to describe how something should be done, and so we can use maybe code uh, to do that. Uh, communicate the system to another person, right? So this is actually one thing that if this sticks in your brain, you'll be a much better programmer going forward, is yes, the computer has to execute and understand your, your commands, right? Your programming language. But more important that, than that in your career is your fellow programmers on your team being able to read and understand your code to know what you intended to do. Has anybody looked at code that they wrote? Like, have you looked at your code you wrote freshman year or beyond? You're like, my gosh, what was I doing? Like, this is just outrageous. I do this now, I have to look back at something. I'm like, oh, who wrote this crap? I'm like, oh, it's me. I wrote it. <laughs> right? And we also want to communicate some kind of instructions to a machine, right? So we touched on this a little bit, but do we have any like CSE folks in the room? Yeah, so some of you super hardware crew. So what does the hard how does the hardware understand our instructions? Is it magic? Does the machine just know? Oh yeah, look at this C program, look at this Python thing, it just like executes and does something, and it's just this magical bit of thing that is at the bottom of our stack that we just do not care about at all? No. So this is one of the main goals of this course, is to get you to understand that nothing in the computing system is magic. There is no magic. You, we are giving you the tools and techniques to understand every layer of the computing stack. From the applications, to operating systems, to hypervisors to firmware to all the way down to like hardware level. So you should know that you can study and understand exactly how everything works, which is super cool. Right? This is like the knowledge that it's kind of like seeing the matrix. You guys have seen the matrix, right? Oh God. Okay. Right? It's like 
seeing the code there, you're like, whoa, I can change things, right? Because you know how everything works. So how does the computer understand? What does the computer, what does the CPU understand? Register operations. It understands uh, machine instructions. Yeah, machine instructions, right? Or assembly language. If we think of it just slightly one step up, they're just ones and zeros, right? At the end of the day, it's just bits. So you could, you could do this, right? Back in the day, on some of the like, I think it's the Altairs, they just had a series of switches, and you had to switch the switches in the right order to do program thing. I don't know. I've never done it. A PDP-8, okay, a PDP-8, eight. 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 okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, never, I, I don't go that low, I just stick to the software level, right? But underneath, right, this is what the CPU, when you look at that chip from Intel or AMD, yeah, AMD, or the one in your phone, which is probably some type of uh, ARM chip, Right? It's fundamentally just executing ones and zeros. It's taking instructions, it's decoding them, it's moving things in registers, and that's what it knows. Right? And so what do we need to get this to happen, right? We want, we want, we talked about how great, we talked about a little, we touched on abstraction, right? That the a programming language gives us some sort of abstraction, so we don't have to code in these ones and zeros. And we can say something that's maybe a little bit more high level. Right? So we can get close to describing the problem and not worrying about, oh, well, to sort this list, first take this memory address and move it into register R0 and then negate that and then do this and then fetch this memory, right? We can think about it at a higher level, right? And so we need programs that translate our intentions to the assembly language that the CPU understands. And so this is where we get to compilers. So what we're focusing on in this course is how does this translation happen? How do, does the computer get our instructions when we, we write a C program? Somehow that C program translates to ones and zeros and the CPU executes it, right? So what is a compiler? Does, anybody, does everyone use a compiler? Everyone, right? Yeah, do you know how it works? You use this every day when you're programming. You don't know how it works. It's crazy, right? Should, huh? That's why we're here. That is why you're here. Very good. Awesome. Yes. That is why you're here to understand how it works. This is an essential part of your tool chain that you use every day. And so not knowing how it works is insane. It'd be like a, what do the people call the chocolate? Like a lumberjack not knowing how like saws work or what different types of saws are. They're just like, I don't know, you just grab something and start swinging at a tree. <laughs> okay. Different for different jobs. So what's a compiler? What's the job of a compiler? Convert what? Ooh, I like that. I heard a weird crowdsourced answer. <laughs> I'm not sure it's due to any one of them. Yeah, come back. So I can think of it in a couple ways, because there's like the, the high level definition of a compiler really to me is just translates from one thing to another. Right? The Java, the Java C compiler, the Java, Java C program that compiles a Java program to a Java bytecode, I consider that a compiler, even though it's not compiling it down to machine code, that x86 code that can actually run on your processor. But it's translating, right? But there are different types of these things. So compilers. Translate a programming language really to an executable binary that essentially just goes to the processor and executes with various steps in between that you learn in like operating system classes. So how does that differ from an interpreter? Somebody else. Just translating 
it interprets, it understands that primary language, and it performs the actual computation. So it, it does use binary, it has to call out all that stuff, right? The interpreter is usually written in C. Um, some interpreters do just-in-time compilation, where they will interpret things, and then when they see that, hey, this thing's been used a lot, they'll compile it to binary on the fly. Um, what about transpiler? I actually hate this. Yeah, changing one programming language into another. Right? So there's anybody do JavaScript programming? Anybody do JavaScript programming in those crazy, like, um, I, now I forgot the name of them. Like the languages that aren't JavaScript but are JavaScript like. What was it? Not Dart. Keep shouting. Uh, was it? TypeScript. TypeScript, yes, TypeScript is a good example, right? TypeScript um, is a language developed by Microsoft that has static typing for JavaScript, and you can add annotations and things, but they have a transpiler that will transpile that to actual JavaScript code. Uh, there's other languages, I can't remember that are What was it? CopyScript, yes, that's the one I was thinking of, yes. CopyScript has crazy different syntax that's not very related to JavaScript, but you can transpile it to JavaScript so it runs on your browser. There's all kinds of stuff here. So sorry for keeping you so long, but I want to get into this. On Monday, so important lecture on Monday, we're going to finish this, and then we're going to do essential programming language, or programming 